You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I am Paul Garner. And I am Todd Wood. Uh, Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell and leave us a comment or a review um, and Don't forget to tell your friends about the podcast because all of that is very, very welcome, really helps us to spread the word and uh, grow the podcast. So we're very grateful for all of you um, doing all of those things. This is going to be uh, an interesting episode, Todd, because it's one that I've been hoping we could do for some time. Um, Recently, I've been seeing a lot of evangelicals talking about the biblical genealogies, and in particular the genealogies in Genesis, and particularly focusing on the question of the lifespans of the patriarchs listed in those genealogies. Right. And it kind of led me to do some background reading of my own. I started to read some of the literature that people were writing, uh, those who were defending uh, these accounts are sort of fairly straightforward historical records, and also those who were arguing for a more symbolical or figurative kind of reading of the the patriarchal li- lifespans. And I, I just thought that it would be it was about time really that that we did an episode about this because it's a it's a fascinating topic. And I, I think we've hinted, you know, in the past that w- we would probably do something along these lines. And and here it is, or at least this is the beginning of it, because yeah. <laughs> um, as we as we were talking about this, we realized this is such an enormous topic. There is so much packed yeah. into these genealogies um, that really, rather than being a single episode, this is going to be the beginning of one of those occasional series that we, we launch. Um, we've already got several on the go, because yeah. we're already doing great discoveries in creationism and we're doing our radiometric dating series, which we need to come back to at some point. Yep. And, you know, we've got, we've got these series going on. Um, this is going to be another one. Uh, this is going to be a kind of introduction. Uh, and w- we'll kind of skim over, I think some of the issues, uh, but we'll probably come back, you know, we'll come back to these topics a bit later. Um, and the reason, uh, you know, I think it would be good for us to do do this series is because this is such an important question yeah. within the world of creationism. Because um, it, it's it kind of gets to the heart of why we are young age creationists at all. You know, it sort yeah. of is is all to do with the young age bit uh, of of the the, the tag and. Um, there are obviously other things as well um, involved in why we're young age creationists, but clearly the gene- genealogical information in the Bible, you know, is a central um, element to, to all of this. And so I think it would be very helpful for us to um, look at this. So perhaps I could uh, sort of kick this episode off um, by talking about the actual texts in question that there are two of them, of course, two key passages in the book of Genesis, Genesis 5 and Genesis chapter 11. And I think it would just be helpful to, to briefly think about those to set the context. The first um, of the passages, Genesis chapter 5, and it's really the whole of the, the chapter, um, gives a, a genealogy that runs all the way from Adam through to Noah and his sons. Uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, so we've got about 11, I think it's 11 generations. And one of the things that immediately strikes you as you read this uh, this passage is that there is a repeated formula in how the genealogical information is presented. Uh, so for example, um, if we look at Genesis 5 verses 6 to 8, we read this. And Seth lived a hundred and five years and begat Enos. And Seth lived after he begat Enos eight hundred and seven years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were nine hundred and twelve years. And he died. 
So we've got this sort of formula where we we have uh, so and so lived for X number of years, and he begat a particular named son, and then so and so lived for X number of years after he begat that son, had other sons and daughters, and all the days of so and so were X years, and then he died. And that formula is just kind of repeated. Right. You can just change, switch the names up, and that's repeated throughout the passage. When we come to Genesis chapter 11, um, we have here uh, a genealogy that takes us from um, Shem, uh, one of Noah's sons, all the way through to Terah's sons, including Abram, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So we have 10 generations. And we do have also uh, a, a kind of formula but it's a bit different from the formula in Genesis 5. So, uh, for example, Genesis 11 verses 18 to 19 says this, And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ru, and Peleg lived after he begat Ru 209 years and begat sons and daughters. So what you'll notice there is that um, the summary statement about the total lifespan of Peleg and his death is omitted. But otherwise, you know, it's a, it's a similar kind of formula, but some of the information is omitted. And I think, um, you know, as we look at those two passages, one of the things that has always struck me is that it's almost inviting you, isn't it? to do the maths yes yeah <laughs> to add up the numbers <laughs> yep um you know you, you just want to kind of add up the figures and work out how much time has elapsed from the time of the creation of adam to the birth of abram and people have done that you know this is something that if you if you look at the literature for as long as you know we have outside commentary on these passages people have basically taken these numbers and added them up and sort of worked out what these, these time periods are. However, um, it actually turns out to be a whole lot more complex in, in lots of ways. There are lots of, uh, I think what you've described, Todd, as wrinkles um, in, in, this, in these passages. And I think what we'll do in this episode is talk about what some of those wrinkles are. What are some of the complexities? And then in future episodes, we're going to come back and we'll probably look at those things in a bit more detail. Yeah. We'll probably invite on some guests who are experts who can help us to talk through some of this because we are not experts in, um, in these passages. Um, we are very much drawing on scholarship done by others here. Um, so we'll try and get some people back to, you know, sort of onto the podcast to talk about it with us. Um, so this is really just an introduction, um, just to kind of set, set the scene. So, Todd, help us sort of get into this. What's the first wrinkle that you see yeah. in trying to work out what these genealogies are really all about? Yeah, this is, a, this is one of those passages I think most people, you know, they start the year with their read through the Bible in a year plan, and they hit this, and they just sort of skim through it think about the names yeah. and then just get to the end of it. And when you start to unpack it, like you say, it's so deep and so <laughs> surprisingly rich that you think, how is this list of boring names and numbers so, so full of interesting stuff? Anyway, yeah. so the first thing that I notice in this passage that's really important is the ages of the patriarchs and and you've already sort of you, you you quoted a couple of ages there when you go through genesis 5 for example um you are seeing ages listed that are well over 900 years old so adam for example adam fathers seth when he was 130 years old and then he lives another 800 years after that, and he lives to be 930. So to put that into a little bit of context, 
930 years ago would have been, uh, what would that be, 1090? So just after, just the, the next generation after William the Conqueror uh, took over England. Uh, that, that's what we're talking about here. And somebody lived that entire period of time. That's, that's pretty incredible stuff. Um, and when you look around, of course, at the modern world, you see people living um, much shorter lives. <laughs> uh, you know, we're living to be, you know, in a, in a developed country with modern sanitation and nutrition and health care. You're probably looking at getting to at least your 70s. Um, my dad just turned 85 um, and he's still getting along. Uh, and occasionally you'll hear people living into, you know, the early second century of their lives, right? <laughs> there they are past a hundred and that's it. And they get mentioned on the Today program and whatever. But that's, I mean, that's as far as it goes. Um, and, you know, people will, people will say... Oh, back closer to creation, people were stronger back then, and so they lived longer. Or there was some unique condition in the atmosphere, or in the climate, or in the whatever, the food they were eating before the flood that allowed them to do this. I, that, as a biologist, I'm looking at that thinking, that's just not going to explain the difference. And so one of the reasons I say that is just the way our bodies not um, die, but the way that they age, right? So, you know, your teeth are going to wear out pretty good by the time you're 80 years old and you're going to, they're going to fall out. Your joints are going to do very similar things. I remember distinctly as I aged into my 30s and 40s thinking, wow, I guess my knee just hurts now. I, I don't know why. <laughs> it just does. That knee hurts. Or my, my hands are tight and stiff and sore, and I don't know why that is. Uh, they're s more sore this morning because it's cold outside as we record. Uh, why? Because we just get old, and our bodies don't renew our connective tissues and our bones and so forth, and our teeth. They grow we grow an extra pair once in our lives when we're very young and that's it those are our permanent adult teeth and they that's what we have um and so you know you can change your nutrition you can change the climate but you're not going to change just the the general wear and tear the senescence the aging that that occurs in normal human bodies and studying uh, biologists who study this sort of thing, it's called life history research. Um, they've discovered a number of genes in other, in other mammals that can significantly extend lifespan, uh, which I think is really interesting. So it makes me wonder if there hasn't been a genetic change um, that alters, uh, that altered our composition. But that's a, that's a you know, that's, that's, a, that's a peculiarity. Um, we're not looking at a simple genealogy here where you could just read it over and not even bat an eyelash at the idea of adding up the ages to come up with a with a time span. We're talking about people who live hundreds of years, and that's not what we see in the in the post flood um, genealogy, the one in Genesis eleven. We it's fascinating because the the, the lifespan decreases gradually. Um, and in fact, this is sort of a classic, uh, classic thing that mathematicians like to do is to fit that, fit those ages to a simple exponential decay curve. It fits really, really well. Um, so yeah, it, it, you, you have this sense that whatever's going on back then is not like what it is today, that the people that were living and their, their, their lifespans and their lives are being recorded in these passages are not like us. And so you can imagine how people would come away and say these are clearly mythological or whatever because nobody can live that long and so forth. But that's sort of an open question in my mind. So yeah. what's, what's, what's yeah. another wrinkle in the passage here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 
what what you said so far is is kind of fascinating and you know at some point we will have to dig more into the the the, the whole sort of biology of aging yeah, and yeah definitely uh you know what's environmental and what's genetic and all, all of that um that that is really very very interesting um yeah so this extreme longevity of the patriarchs that, that you've kind of referred to there um like you say, it it's led many people to suggest that these numbers are not really lifespans at all, but they have some kind of symbolic or figurative significance. Uh, for example, some have said maybe it's some kind of honor code. You know, it's some way of honoring your patriarchs by ascribing to them long lifespans. But these aren't really meant to be understood as. Um, you know, as 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 real yeah. ages that these people live to, and if we were kind of in the culture, we would sort of understand this. You know, we would understand that this this was some way of sort of honor, honoring the the patriarchs. And they point to a couple of uh, things really to support this idea. Uh, the first one is a really intriguing one. It's it's the fact that the ages that are ascribed to the patriarchs are not random. Uh, when you when you look at the last digits in those ages in Genesis chapter five, we've we've got nine patriarchs, okay, that they, they are listed with a full lifespan, and the first seven of those lifespans all end in a zero, a five, or a two. So that doesn't seem random. No. Um, then, of course, we have Methuselah, who lived to 969, and Lamech, that lived to 777. So that doesn't quite sort of fit that. But the fact that seven of the nine um, you know, end in a zero, five, or a two, that seems very non-random. So what's the explanation there? Is there some kind of rounding that's going on? Are, are the ages being rounded in some way? Uh, others have said it's a clue that these are not really ages at all right. that there's something else going on so that's the first thing and then the second thing is we have this peculiar recurrence of the number 60 when you look at the total lifespans of the patriarchs there they're all quite close to some multiple of 60 and you might think well you know, for most of the patriarchs in Genesis 5, that's not really very surprising because they all live to beyond 900 years old. Yeah. And 900 is 15 times 60. So maybe that's, that's not so surprising. But then we've got Enoch. And Enoch is an exception, right? So Enoch only lives until he's 365 when he's translated, mm -hmm. or however we understand that. Yep. Um, and that's quite close to a multiple of 60. It's uh, quite close to six times 60. And then we've also got Lamech. Uh, Lamech has this lifespan, as we said, of 777 years. That's quite close to 13 times 60. And Methuselah. Methuselah lives to be 969 years old. That's quite close to 16 times 60. So... Even when we take into account the patriarchs that have um, a shorter lifespan, uh, you still sort of seem to see this sort of 60 multiple pattern. Now, why does that matter? Well, some scholars have pointed out that the ancient Sumerians had a, uh, a, a number system that was based on multiples of 60, a bit like we have the, the decimal system, which is based on multiples of 10. They had a sexagesimal system, which was based on multiples of 60. Uh, and some scholars have said, when you look at the ages of the patriarchs in Genesis 5, they work out to multiples of 60, maybe plus or minus some multiple of a sacred number like five or two or seven it gets really complicated yeah and it can also seem i think a little bit contrived yeah uh and not all scholars you know agree 
uh, with this. It hasn't convinced everybody. It seems a little bit ad hoc at times. But nevertheless, quite a number of scholars have kind of picked up on this um, multiple of 60 type pattern in, in this passage. So that combined with the fact that the, the ages don't appear random, that they seem to end in particular digits, have led many scholars to say, we shouldn't interpret these literally. There is something else going on. So that's another wrinkle. So we have the long lifespans, and then we have scholarship looking at intriguing patterns in, in the numbers in, in this chapter. Yeah. Uh, what else, Todd? What else kind of sticks out in your mind about? Ooh. I think those, those, that, that multiple of 60 thing is fascinating because none of them are really an exact multiple of 60. They're off right. by, by a few. But then you have Lamech yes. and Enoch who are not even close to 900 and they're, <laughs> they're close to a multiple of 60. Um, yeah. Enoch's within five of a multiple of 60, Lamech's within three. Um, really weird stuff. It just makes me scratch my head and think, what is going on here? But then in Genesis 11, yeah. you don't have that pattern at all. That's only, that right. only applies to Genesis 5. Yeah. Really weird. All right. So we've already said the, the big thing about reading these passages is that you come away thinking, it feels like, it feels like the author here really wants me to add up these numbers, right? And to right. come up with, a, with an age. Yeah. And that that then would give me some idea of the, t the span of time between creation and, and the birth of Abraham. And that feels right. I mean, I read these passages yeah. and I think, yeah, that's exactly. Let me get my calculator and get some paper over here and <laughs> I, can, I can add these all up. It, it seems so obvious. Yeah. But there's a wrinkle in that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not one that you would notice if you only read your English Bible version of Genesis 5 and 11. You, you might not even see it. But if you go flip forward in your Bible to the book of Luke, where, mm. the, where, the, where the genealogy is repeated, it's, it's abbreviated, it doesn't have all the ages in it, it just gives you the begats and so forth, um, you'll notice something kind of peculiar when you compare Genesis to Luke. So in Luke chapter 3, verses 35 to 36, we see um, Shem's grandson. Shem's grandson is named as Canaan, who is the son uh, of Shem's son Arphaxad. So Shem begat Arphaxad, Arphaxad begat Canaan. And then Canaan has a son named Shelah. Okay, so it goes Shem, Arphaxad, Cana. Canaan and Shelah. Genesis 11, uh, the source from which Luke is quoting here, or summarizing, uh, has the same genealogy, and it goes from Shem, uh, Shem begat Arphaxad, and Arphaxad begat Shelah. So, oh well, now that's weird, is, is Arphaxad's son Shelah, as it says in Genesis, or is it Canaan? as it says in Luke. And which one is right, or are they both right, or what's going on? What, what's happening here? And the answer, it turns out, opens up a huge bag of worms, a huge can of worms, and you're never going to get the worms back in the can because this is just super complicated. So it turns out here that Luke is not quoting from the Hebrew Old Testament. Luke is quoting from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, which kind of makes sense because Luke is a Gentile. Um, so he's reading the Septuagint. Now, we've mentioned the Septuagint in lots of different episodes before, reminding all our audience members, Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was made a couple centuries before Christ. So um, this was made in Egypt, and uh, it's called the Septuagint because it was 70 different scholars working on on this that produced the Septuagint. And as the legend goes, they were all translating in isolation and produced exactly the same translation. I don't know that I believe that story, but yeah. It's definitely an Egyptian uh, translation uh, into Greek of the Hebrew Old Testament. So when you look at the Septuagint, 
you find that's where the extra canine comes from. Uh, the Septuagint has this extra canine that Luke quotes in his gospel. Okay, so, huh. Then you start looking more closely at what the Septuagint records in Genesis, and you realize the numbers are slightly different. And this is, this is even more complicated. So if, if you add up the numbers there in Genesis 5 and 11, and then you put that into context with the rest of the Old Testament, and how the, the, the rest of the chronology continues. If you do that, you're going to come from, from the Hebrew version. You're going to come close to uh, the 4004 BC that you see in your Schofield Reference Bible, or that you may have heard about Bishop Usher coming to 4004 BC from his calculations. If you do the same calculation with the Septuagint, you're going to come to about 5,500 years from creation to the birth of Christ. Okay, so <laughs> that's weird. Um, <laughs> and this raises just a lot of, a lot of complicated questions. Um, and the big question for me is, why are these different? Why are they different? And, and of course, um, you know, you might be wondering which one is the original. You know, which one's... Which one's the modification and which one records the original genealogy and the original numbers? And of course, in all of that, then I wonder, well, why would anyone think it would be okay to monkey around with these numbers in the first place? <laughs> I thought when scribes made their copies of scripture, they were very careful to do it exactly the way that they read it. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's two possibilities that I've heard. These are the, I would say, let's call them the most plausible explanations. And they are plausible explanations for both directions. So, for example, you might think that the Septuagint preserves the original, the original reading and that it was modified in the Hebrew to be shorter. Now, why would that happen? Okay. Here's, here's the logic behind that. Uh, we have a number of church fathers who claim that the Hebrews have modified the Hebrew text of the Old Testament in order to make it less Christian, um, in order to make some of the prophecies of Jesus that are really, really obvious in the Old Testament seem a lot less obvious. So... We have, those, we have those claims from early church fathers. Uh, so why would the Genesis genealogies fit in there? Well, one of the things that the early church fathers would do would be to emphasize Jesus as the second Adam, right? This is, this is coming from Paul's letters where he, where he uses Christ as an analogy uh, with, I'm sorry, uses Adam as an analogy for Christ. So Adam comes and sins. And by that one sin, he brings death on everyone. And Jesus comes and is obedient unto death. And by his resurrection, then he can bring life to everyone. So that's the analogy. And playing on that analogy, they like to say, using the Septuagint numbers, look, Jesus is born in the sixth millennium. And you remember the Bible says that a thousand years is as a day to the Lord, right? And so... You imagine, you think back to when Adam's created. Adam's created on the sixth day. And if a millennium is like a day, then Jesus is born on the sixth millennium, which makes it all work out just beautifully, right? So there were, there were church fathers who sort of expected uh, the, the second advent to come at the end of that sixth millennium. They, they were kind of estimating that it's going to be a couple centuries, but Jesus is going to come and usher in the millennial kingdom. That's going to be the, the seventh day of rest from the day of, day of create, days of creation. So, so the idea there is to, in order to thwart that reasoning that some of the rabbis went around and modified the Hebrew texts so that they were shorter. So the idea there is that they've shortened what was a longer genealogy, chronology. The other possibility, which I think 
honestly, it seems to me is equally possible, um, is that while because this is a Greek translation being made in Egypt, and because people are aware of Egyptian historical records that go back many thousands of years, that the the Septuagint translators intentionally inflated the original Hebrew chronology to make it longer so that it would be less weird to Egyptian readers who were aware of these thousand year uh, uh, thousand year chronologies from Egyptian um so <laughs> I find them both quite plausible they seem pretty pretty good to me um now there's of course questions about you know, is it, is it really likely that there could be rabbis going around modifying texts of the Old Testament? Yeah, that's a very good question. And frankly, I think just a good question is, who, who, who translating the Old Testament thought it was okay to just modify things? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. So, so yeah, so there you go. We've got the Septuagint yeah. numbers. We've got the Masoretic numbers, the Hebrew numbers. Which one is right? Which one was first? Um, and why are they being modified? Good question. And I don't know that we have good answers. We're going to have to get a, a Septuagint expert on here to talk about this, uh, I think, a little bit more yeah. in detail because it's fascinating. So yeah. other wrinkles. What do you got, Paul? What do, yeah. you, what do you think? Yeah, well, this, this, just, this just gets more and more complicated the more we yeah, <laughs> think right? about it. Um, it seemed so simple at the beginning of this episode, and now now we're kind of getting into the weeds here. Um, well, another an, another kind of wrinkle to think about is, you know, even once we've decided that question, you know, which which of the texts, the the Masoretic Hebrew text or the Greek Septuagint text, is the correct one, and we haven't even mentioned the Samaritan Pentateuch, which I think has got different numbers again. Um, there's another big question, which is um, can we actually use Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 to construct a chronology at all? Uh, and this question was the, the one that was raised by a very well-known Presbyterian theologian. Uh, he was a professor, I think, for nearly 50 years at Princeton Seminary, a man called William Henry Green. And in 1890, he wrote an article in a theology journal, and his article was entitled Primeval Chronology. And in that article, he basically looked at all of the genealogies in the Bible and uh, compared them and tried to draw some conclusions. And his main conclusion was that when you compare different passages in the Bible, that record the same genealogy. And we've already mentioned yeah. one example yeah. where Luke, mm -hmm. you know, summarizes a genealogy that we find in the book of Genesis. What you often find is that um, generations get left out. So there is this tendency in the Bible to shorten genealogies. And a good question might be, why? Uh, why is that happening? And it, the answer seems to be, or at least this is what many suggest, is that it's it's an aid to memorization. It helps people remember them. You kind of you keep in all the really important names, and you you leave you leave the others out. Sure. Um, and so basically, by analogy with these kinds of comparative examples, um, Green suggested that we can't really be dogmatic about the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, that perhaps there are generations that have been left out of these genealogies, uh, and maybe we, we don't even know that. And so we can't use them to construct a chronology. And I think... Um, that argument is one that has been very influential in the church because oh, yeah. whenever, and you know, you know this as well as I do, whenever we talk about the question of biblical chronology, the, the question always comes up, what about gaps in the genealogies? What about missing generations? Yep. So 
try and untangle this. What you know? What do we make of of Green's argument here? I think there are a few things to say. The first thing is that he's arguing, obviously, by analogy, um, and arguments from analogy are not necessarily the strongest kinds of arguments. Sure. Um, so this is, you know, with, this is not an area like um, science where we can, can we can come up with some law of missing generations, right? <laughs> right. So right um, that, that, that applies in every single instance. I, I think the best we could say is that. Um, we can't be sure whether there are missing generations in Genesis 5, for example. Um, one of the other things that always occurs to me is how do we know in those cases that, you know, where we do know a genealogy has been shortened, how do we know that it's been shortened? Because a fuller version is included somewhere else. Right. Now, what we don't have it seems, is a fuller version of Genesis 5 and 11 somewhere else that suggests that there are missing generations. So I'm, I'm not sure this analogy really um, it, it, it is very strong. Let, let, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, a second point that I think we can make is that, in effect, the missing generations don't really matter because of the formula that we talked about earlier. Uh, you'll remember that uh, you know we talked about that repetitive uh, formula that we find particularly in Genesis five, but we we find something similar in Genesis eleven. It's just that the numbers are not added up. Um, it doesn't really matter, you know, when, when the Bible says Enoch was sixty five when he begat Methuselah. It doesn't really matter if there are missing generations, and if Methuselah is. Enoch's son or his grandson or his great-grandson, so long as you know that Enoch was 65 when Methuselah was born, which is what the genealogy seems to say. Right. So if that's the case, then actually you could say there might be a missing generation or two here, and you can still add up the numbers. It still works, right? So so that's that's another problem, I think, with Green's argument. The third uh, comment to make, really, about all of this is that um, Green's analogy depends on comparing Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 with genealogies elsewhere in the Bible that we know have been shortened. But actually, they're not very comparable. Uh, those other genealogies do not have the structure of the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11. They don't have, for example, this repetitive formula with all of the details that would allow you to, to make a chronology of it um, in the same way that these genealogies do. And in fact, you can see that even in the book of Genesis itself, because if you look in Genesis 4 and you look in Genesis 10, there are other genealogies that you might call more typical biblical genealogies. And really, Genesis 5 and 11 stand out in contrast to those. Um, and the contrast is perhaps all the greater, because in passages around them, you've got these more typical genealogies. So it seems that there's something unique going on with Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 that I think makes that analogy argument um, even weaker, when you, when you just realize how different these particular genealogies are. Uh, so, yeah, so, so that's another wrinkle. Can we use these numbers to construct a chronology? What do we make of arguments like the ones presented by William Henry Green that have been so influential yeah. um, in, in these kinds of discussions? Yeah. So, yeah. Every, every time, Something else to think every about. time I, I talk to anybody who's had any seminary training, it's going to come up. Do you know that genealogies yeah. have gaps? You can't yep. can't say that doesn't have gaps, and it all goes back yep. to Green's Green's article. Um, that's where it all started. Uh, yeah, so it's really important. But you're right. The, the the you know when you start looking at the genealogies in the in the Old Testament, you realize really quickly Genesis five and eleven stand out so strikingly differently. They're not like the others. 
And so I become real suspicious right away of anybody trying to make this argument from analogy from the other genealogies, because that's not, that's not what I'm seeing in this passage. Yeah. There is another wrinkle that we're going to have to get an archaeologist in here to talk about, because this is <laughs> fascinating to me. So you've mentioned already the 60, the recurrence of the, the pattern of multiples of 60 in Genesis um, 5. Uh, and that's, that's important because the Sumerians had a, a counting system that's based on 60. It's a sexagesimal uh, counting system. Um, okay, so there's, there's actually another wrinkle that that brings up, and that is there is known from Sumerian literature a very peculiar list of names, it's almost like a genealogy, that has fantastically large numbers, kind of like what you see in Genesis 5. Uh, and this is known as the Sumerian king list. And it's preserved to us. We know this from um, basically clay tablets written in cuneiform. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, the ancient Sumerians would use clay to write on as their writing surface. And they had this little, think of it kind of like a little screwdriver, a little flat screwdriver that they would just stick into the clay and make these, these symbols. Um, and that would be their writing system. And so you could bake the clay when it's done, let it dry or bake it or whatever. And you would have this fired clay tablet with stuff written on it. And so that stuff survives pretty well, a lot better than papyrus or other parchment or whatever you might use that's sort of like paper. Um, so we have these fragments of the Sumerian king list. And there's one mostly complete copy. Um, it's today found in the collections of the Ashmolean Museum at um, Oxford. And it's called the Weld Blundell Prism. And to prepare for this episode, I have made myself a little scale copy version of the Weld Blundell Prism. This is it right here. I made a little, did a little paper craft yesterday after church fall. Here it is. Um, <laughs> so this is the Weld Blundell Prism. Um, and you can see, I'll just hold it up here. You can see a little cuneiform uh, writing on it. And this, this is the one copy we have that preserves the entire pre-flood passage where we can read the whole thing. Um, there are other copies that also have later parts of the, you can see it goes on all the way around here. Um, and we have other copies that preserves the later portions. And we have a couple of fragments of the early stuff. But to find the full version of the Sumerian Kings list, it's on the Weld Blundell Prism in uh, the Ashmolean Museum. And we'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes. It's great now that this digital age is great. You can, you can look at high-resolution photographs of it. You can see the, the Sumerian, uh, the cuneiform transcription. You can read translations. Here's the passage in question. So let me read to you in English um, this passage, and you will talk about some interesting points of similarity and difference. So, uh, from the Sumerian king's list. After the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. In Eridu, Alulim became king. He ruled for 28,800 years. Uh, Alihar ruled for 36,000 years. Two kings, they ruled for 64,800 years. Then Eridu fell, and the kingship was taken to Bad Tibera. In Bad Tibera, Enmen Galanu, uh, no, sorry, in Bad Tibera, Enmen Luana ruled for 43,200 years. Enmen Galana ruled for 28,800 years. Demuzid, the shepherd, ruled for 36,000 years. Three kings, they ruled for 108,000 years. Then Bad Tibera fell, and the kingship was taken to Larag. In Larag, Enspadzidana, ruled for 28,800 years. One king, he ruled for 28,800 years. Then Larag fell, and the kingship was taken to Zimber. In Zimber, Enmed Duranu became king. He ruled for 21,000 years. One king, he ruled for 21,000 years. Then Zimber fell, and the kingship was taken to Kurapag. In Kurapag, 
Ubara Tulu became king, he ruled for 18,600 years. One king, he ruled for 18,600 years. In five cities, eight kings, they ruled for 241,200 years. Then the flood swept over. Okay. Wow. And then it goes on after that. Um, and it lists uh, what we would think of as post-flood kings. And they immediately start reigning about a thousand years. So the fantastical ages drop from multiple tens of thousands of years to just a thousand years. There's no exponential drop like you see in Genesis 5. Okay, I'm sorry, in Genesis 11. Genesis 11 is the exponential drop. All right, so some interesting points. Uh, the SKL, the Sumerian king list, begins with the creation, right? When, the, when kingship descended from heaven. Um, and you look in Genesis 5, it also begins with the creation of Adam. So you have that point in common. We see obvious, the big, the big obvious point of similarity is the unnaturally long time that's listed. Uh, in the case of the Sumerian king list, 241,000 years. In the case of Genesis, is about 1,600 years between creation and the flood. Um, the list uh, concludes with the flood, just like it does in Genesis 5. Well, Genesis 5 concludes with Noah and his three sons, which then leads you directly into the, the account of the flood. Uh, the numbers in the Sumerian king list definitely based on multiples of 60. Um, they, in fact, you can just divide it out and find out for yourself. And the symbols in the cuneiform are pretty clear. They're referring to um, multiples of 60 as well. And this is much clearer than you have in Genesis uh, 5, where you constantly sort of have to fudge the numbers to get them to be exact multiples of 60. Here in the, in the Sumerian Kings list, they are exact multiples of 60. Um, here in, in the Sumerian Kings list, the numbers are deliberately added up for you, so you can see what they add up to. Uh, that doesn't happen in Genesis 5. Genesis 5 is more of a tease in that way, just sort of giving you these ages, and you think, oh, I can add that up. Yeah. Um, so there's, that's a difference. Uh, the Sumerian King list does sound like it's more deliberate in trying to compose a, uh, a chronology. Uh, and then you have, you know, you got your 11 patriarchs in, in, the, in Genesis 5, and you've got eight kings listed in the Sumerian kings list. Okay, so really striking stuff here. Um, and then you got to wonder, well, why are these passages similar the way they are? Why aren't... And I guess you could take two approaches. Um, one approach might be that this was just how things were done in the ancient cultures like that, the ancient Near Eastern cultures. They just would assign important people really long ages. And there was already a tradition there of people from before the flood living for spectacularly long periods of time. So the Bible author and the, the author of the Sumerian King List are coming from that shared cultural background, and they're writing their own versions of those of those stories or those um, the way that way of thinking. Uh, so, and I want to emphasize this: no nobody that I could find implied that the Sumerian King List was copied into the Bible or anything like that. Um, everybody recognized all these critical scholars who have this ancient Near Eastern perspective. They all recognize there are vast differences between the, the two passages so that they don't just, they, they're not obviously copied. But yeah, so the idea there instead would be that there's this cultural, shared cultural background, knowledge that sort of feeds into the composition of Genesis and the composition of the Sumerian Kings list. And by the way, I didn't mention that, but the, uh, our friend, the uh, Weld Blundell prism, has been dated to about 1800 BC. So it's actually pre-dating, goodness, that's before the Exodus. So that's getting around back to the time of Abraham and Isaac. Um, so well before the composition of Genesis. The other possibility, which would be the creationist possibility, is that both cultures are remembering something real that 
the Israelite culture and the Sumerian culture are both remembering a time from before the flood when people lived really long, unnaturally long lives. And that somehow in the recording of the Sumerian Kings list, this has been turned into some sort of spectacular, you know, tens of thousands of years. And the book of Genesis then is, is a sort of corrective on that that brings the ages back down to some kind of reality, right? Um, where they're only living a thousand years instead of 36,000 years or whatever. Um, so yeah, it, I, you know, it, it fascinates me. This is a, I think it's a fascinating wrinkle. The longer I look into the Sumerian Kings list and the, the arrangement of the numbers, the more they, the more symbolic they seem, the more obviously symbolic they seem. Um, and it really invites, I think it, just like the uh, just like the text of Genesis, it really sort of is very inviting to scholars who are obsessed with looking at numbers and adding things up and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's suckered me in, I'll tell you that. Um, so yeah, yeah uh, it's a fascinating little parallel that you know if you really want to think about the Bible and these genealogies, you really sort of have to think about what is, what is, how is the Sumerian Kings list going to factor into all of these kinds of considerations? Yeah. Another Todd, wrinkle. What, you one, more? Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I've got one more. Um, all right. And then we should probably wind, wind this episode up. I mean, we've, we've covered a huge amount of ground yeah. in this episode and we've raised, we've tossed all these issues up into the air. And we haven't really tried to sort of resolve them here. Um, they're all things we're going to come back to, I, I hope, in this series and look at in more detail. One final sort of wrinkle. Sometimes, you know, when you read uh, non-creationists or anti-creationists who are talking about the the, ge the genealogies, and uh, they will say something like, um, you know, the this creationist tendency to go to Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 and add up the ages to construct some kind of chronology of the world, that is really just a modern development. Um, nobody, nobody before modern creationists was doing this. Um, the ancient peoples weren't really interested in chronology the same way that these creationists are. Um, it's a kind of modern aberration. And uh, sure, they'll you know if you point out to them that, that the church fathers um, seem to believe that the world was young, they'll say yeah, sure. But that was really because of this millennial scheme, you know, that yep. you've already hinted at that um, you know a, a thousand years is like a like a day to the Lord, and so you know as Adam was made on the sixth day of creation, so the last Adam comes on in the sixth millennium, and that's where they get this sort of six thousand year age of the earth from, and. Um, but it's not really from from the genealogies, and uh, I think as we've talked about this, I think we've both come to the conclusion that this is not only incorrect; it is actually the opposite of the truth. Correct. Yes, it is literally <laughs> um, <laughs> the opposite of correct. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so the church fathers um, are actually very concerned about cr chronology. They they do exactly the same thing that modern creationists do. They add up the the, the numbers and they come up with a chronology and actually they infer the symbolic meaning from that from that literal meaning it's it's that way around and um one one example that i know you've talked about on your blog is uh hippolytus who um in in uh the chronicon this is the early third century um he uses the genealogies just the same way that modern creationists do. He adds up the numbers and he works out, you know, how many years was it from Adam to Abraham? And then how many years was it to the time of David? And, you know, how many years between Adam and Christ? And, you know, and he, he does all of that. Sure. He, he also in another work, if they're written by the same guy, he also, um, seems to, take this kind of millennial sort of scheme, this, this approach. Yep. But again, it's one of these cases where the church fathers are, are doing both. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're reading the text in multiple ways. There are d different ways that they're, they're reading it. Um, and one is not exclusive to, you know, to the other. Um, so I think when, when you begin to 
to sort of realize that you realize that what we're doing in looking at this passage and going, boy, it looks as if I'm meant to add those numbers up and, and come up with a, a chronology. We are not doing anything new. We are doing what generations of Christians have done before us, probably right back to the times of the apostles and earlier. So, uh, you know, I, I guess I guess ancient you, you could probably find it among the ancient Jews as well that yeah. they were they were adding up numbers and coming up with right. with chronologies. So it's 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 it even predates you know Christianity itself. This is not something new. This is not something that only began in 1961 with Wickham and Morris or, <laughs> or whatever. This is, this is a long tradition of, of what Christians have done. Uh, doesn't and make I think it, it's just worth rem- Yeah, it does, yeah. It, go, go it, ahead. It doesn't make it the right way to treat those passages, just right. by the fact that people have always done it. But right for those detractors who want to say, ah, young age creationism is some weird theological aberration yeah. that's only you know 50 years old or 100 years old or whatever uh that doesn't that doesn't follow it's not right <laughs> yeah so yeah 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 so wow we've covered a huge amount of ground there we have. um and there are so many other questions yep uh we could spend a long time talking about all of the things that we've already raised but we we've got to wrap up this episode's going to go really long so (laughs) we will be back uh to talk about these these questions again now it'll probably be later in the year because we've got all kinds of cool things kind of lined up for the for the next few months our schedule is very full that's right um and we've got some interesting plans um but at some point this year we will be coming back to this so see this as kind of part one of another one of these occasional series and uh we hope you'll be back for that. We hope you'll be back um, for all of the other exciting things that we've got coming up too. And so we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. All right. See you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science, and in the UK by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.